This is very nice. I uh, have to say I'm not used to that kind of uh, introduction. I was looking around thinking, God, this guy sounds pretty neat. Who is he? I better meet him pretty soon. It's, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak here tonight. You know, Clinton School has a reputation for bringing in some foreign policy experts from Alan Albright to Richard Hol uh, Holbrook to Brent Scowcroft. All incredibly bright people, smart, experienced, and foreign policy experts. But they're big picture people. And a lot of what happens in Washington doesn't relate back to what happens in the field. So what we're going to talk about tonight are the boots on the ground, what happens with the young men and women, your sons and daughters, people like Mark here who spent time overseas, and how, and how the, the world overseas, and how it's different overseas than what we expect here. Now, geopolitics is different these days. It's not just the US versus USSR about nuclear strength. With the rise of Facebook, Twitter, citizen journalists, and 24-7 news, the actions of the strategic corporal sitting in there working is as important in Washington these days as his actions are in the Helmand River Valley or the Haitian countryside. Now, what you've got to remember is that since 9-11, both American diplomacy and military strategy has changed considerably. We've been fighting two wars, Iraq and Afghanistan. And we've, at the same time, we've had earthquakes, tsunamis, and cyclones in Haiti, Pakistan, and Indonesian Burma. And we've they've probably killed in excess of 500,000 people since 2003. We've also got potential problems with Iran and North Korea, and of course the popular democratic revolts in Tunisia, Egypt, Jordan, and God knows what's going to happen in the Middle East. And like it or not, the United States is more involved today globally than ever before, be it through military action, globalization, or as Bill Clinton would say, dollarization, uh, or simply because of our military's unsurpassed ability to turn, turn around and, and uh, conduct humanitarian relief, the United States is still today the leading source of power and authority around the world. So you can call it what you like, but we're, what, what we're doing is nation building, a term that's not used very often. But that's what that's what's, we're doing over there. But we're not rebuilding, excuse me, we're not building new nations, we're rebuilding old ones. We're rebuilding failed states like Afghanistan, collapsed states like Haiti, or in evolving states like Egypt or Tunisia. And why are we doing this, you ask? You, you, because we have problems at home with the budgets, immigration, and unemployment. Now, as some politicians suggest, we can walk away and do nothing. But if, you, if we do that, those pesky Haitians, they keep on swimming up on our beaches in Florida. And those faraway Afghans, and Afghanistan is about as far away as you can get, uh, let Al-Qaeda fly from Kandahar to, to launch the 9-11 attacks. So today's world is post, today's post World War II world is different than it used to be. So maybe we need to be more proactive in today's world. So in today's multipolar world of states, non-states, non-state actors, we need to turn around and, and, and spend more time with them before they come over here. So fighting wars by the old way has cost us dearly. 4,400 plus killed in Iraq, 1,600 or so in Afghanistan, and a lot of Americans aren't sure why we're, we're, why we're doing this neither. And let's not forget the trillion dollars we've spent and the human cost in the future of taking care of our vet wounded veterans for decades afterwards. And none of this addresses the problems of Haiti, Pakistan, Somalia, West Africa, and those other fun spots around the world. But before we talk about Afghanistan and Haiti and why, Af and why I think counterinsurgency is, is the best policy, let's take a quick tour of the world today. We've got a population. This is just pulled from the newspaper. This is just what's going on today. Haiti, a disaster for the past 50 years. I was down there last year, after the, five days after the earthquake. It's worse today. Pakistan, a failed state. 50, they got 100 to 110 nuclear weapons and the delivery system to deliver it into Western Europe. Their government supports uh, Al-Qaeda. The ISI support Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. This is a disaster. Afghanistan, we'll talk about later. Somalia makes the newspapers all the time, and not well. Sudan, another disaster. Mexico, they killed a missionary in Mexico last week, a, a, an older lady out of Texas. Uh, she and her husband were driving back from visiting a church south of the border. A gang chased her and the husband in the, in the trucks for going on 20 miles shooting as, as, they, as they drove. The missionary husband, with his wife dying behind him, fled across the border into, into the States trying to drive to the hospital. That's how bad it is down there. Lebanon, Hezbollah now is the, is the political party down there. So you've got the, you know, after the uh, Israelis lost the war to Lebanon in 2006, Hezbollah came in, funded by, Is funded by Iran, and started taking over that southern part of Lebanon. And what's the common factor 
No central government, no border security, corruption, no basic services, or the basic services like Lebanon or in Mexico provided by the gangsters and the warlords. When I was at a Camp Pendleton a couple months ago giving a speech, somebody said, hey, sir, what should we do to prepare for Afghanistan? I said, watch every issue of The Sopranos. Because what you have there, you have these gangsters and drug lords and the warlords, there's little fiefdoms. There's not a central government. There's a central government of, he runs one town, she runs another. This is almost like the Middle Ages, except they're all heavily armed. So the world today, almost seven billion people. And of the seven billion people, the gap between, you've got, look at it this way. We've had, we're just coming out of a global economic crash, or not, depending on who you listen to. And the fastest growing populations are the, small, are the poorest. Global unemployment exceeds 15%, and the gap between the rich and the poor widens hourly. Food and energy prices are skyrocketing with worldwide inflation, and now they're getting to the point where food availability and famine is again, is again an issue. One of the problems in, in Egypt, because they, no, they have no farms worth anything, they import all their wheat, most of it from us and then the government subsidizes it. So we give them subsidized wheat, they subsidize it again, they've run out of money. So the people are running out of wheat because they can't, because the poor people, and they, they earn an average of $2 a day, can't afford food. That's a, that's, that's a disaster, that's 90 million Egyptians, and that, that's a, a trouble spot in the making. And that's in between, or in addition to the problem that's happening with Mubarak and all that. So what should the civilized world worry about? Another 9-11? More bombings in London or Bali, or maybe another Christmas tree bomber. It's hard to say, but what it does show is that religious fanaticism is alive and well, and that the smart person might want to see what brought the uh, see these suicide bombers to this edge of madness. Now, I talk a lot about the Marines. Uh, can't go wrong doing that, number one, and number two, I bed with them all the time. So my source of information comes out of Quantico. I spent my 12 embeds. I spend every one of them with the Marines. I do some work with the Army, but month in and month out, I'm in Helmand Province or Anbar Province or someplace like that. So it's not a knock on any of the services, I just spend time with the Marines. So that's, you look at what they have here. This is where, they got what's called the Center of Irregular Warfare, and look at what, they, look at what they're doing. I don't know what you can say, water stress, piracy problems, ungoverned regions, yeah, that's a pretty big part of the world. Emerging potential nuclear powers, well, that's India and Pakistan, that's not a plus. Choke points, which is mostly waterborne. And your world trade goes from the, most of your world trade, the energy trade, goes from around Middle East into India, then into China. And in the last two years, which most people don't realize, China's replaced the United States as the, single, as the world's single, single largest oil importer. India in five more years, excuse me, 10 more years, will become the largest population in the world. So you've got nuclear Pakistan up here, and all the oil and gas the Indians are trying to develop to keep their populations and their economies going come through Pakistan. That's a natural choke point. Not a good one, these things. So you look at some of these problems, and they're all coming out of the Yemens, the Somalias, the Afghanistans, the Pakistans, where your bombers are coming from. So what we're trying to do is come up with a policy. None of this you can turn around and, and use conventional warfare for. The Marines aren't going to land in, in, Af you know, in Pakistan and march north. The Army's not going to send paratroopers into Lahore and turn around and try and, and, try and subdue Lahore. It doesn't work. So let's go back to the rest of the world. Yeah, here we go. No, this one. Oh, here we go. Uh, this, again, some of, the, some of the regional problems and some of the problems that are coming up. And this is just what you see in the news every day. Mexico is losing the battle with the drug wars down there. In the past couple of years, they've had 29,000 of their people killed. Uh, in addition to the torture, dismemberment, you see all the time they find 20 heads here, bodies over there, it's a disaster. 145 Americans have been killed in the past 18 months, and then I mentioned the missionary already. So it'd be fair to say Mexico is spiraling out of control. Colombia is not doing well either. They're more stable than they were, but now the narcos are shipping drugs to Europe via West Africa. In 2008, they shipped 50 tons of coke, cocaine, to Guyana and neighboring Guyana Bissau into Europe, turning them into Africa's first narco states. Now, why is that important to us? Because we import oil from Nigeria and Angola. They're our top five oil suppliers. So any stability problems in West Africa affect our oil shipments into the United States. Venezuela is a mess, again. They squander their oil wealth. 
and now they, now they import food and water, where their nutty dictator spends all his money on, on Russian arms to use against the Colombians and us. Brazil is an economic miracle, except of course for last year when they sent troops into the favelas because their, their warlords and their drug lords were trying to take over the cities. So, they, so their poor people have gotten very, very poor, and the rich people have gotten rich again, a recipe for disaster. And then even before the earthquake, Haiti was, you know, Haiti was one of the poorest countries in the world, ranking down there with such failed states as Zimbabwe and Somalia. Pakistan, I already mentioned, 110 nuclear weapons. Their ISI uh, favors the Taliban, favors al-Qaeda, and is actively fighting against both us and the Pakistani government. China and Pakistan, China and India, we discussed how they're importing oil, except they've got to bring it through oil and gas through Pakistan, which makes it, which makes it uh, their continued success somewhat risky. So why do you ask, does the Marine Corps follow these trends? Well, America's not going to invade these countries, so why, why not ignore them? For example, an Army, chief, an Army general and the chief of staff told me a few months ago, he said, piracy doesn't keep me awake at nights. Well, it should, because, well, because pirates rule the Somali coast. You remember, they're, they're taking oil tankers, they're taking conventional ships. And what happens now, remember a year ago, they captured a Ukrainian ship loaded with tanks and munitions and kept that for six months before, they, before they, it got ransomed out. And the problem with the general statement, in addition to the fact that he's probably wrong, is that while the Somali pirates aren't capable, capable of, of attacking the United States directly, what they can do is provide a base to somebody else. Remember what al-Qaeda did in, in Osama bin Laden. He used Afghanistan as a base, from, a friendly base from which he could launch attacks on the United States. Other people can, can do that from Somalia. So now the Somali pirates are attacking the, Amer the container ships, oil tankers, and then some of the, what they're doing, they move back into the, uh, let's see why I slide. There we go. The biggest problem is when the oil tankers come through here, you gotta come through the Straits of Malacca. So if they were to sink one major tanker, you shut off all the world trade in the, in, that comes through this area. So to say that the piracy isn't a problem to the United States, it very much is. Okay. Now is, so that's what the world is like today. Water issues, food problems, unemployment, drugs, no education, piracy. These are all important social, economic, and, uh, and, and military issues, and none of them, however, like I said, can be solved by the use of conventional forces. So let's also take a look, as this is happening, what's happening in the military warfare today? Well, we've, kind of, we've changed over the years from conventional warfare, Desert Storm, World War II, to this irregular warfare, where, the, where people target civilians inst instead of other soldiers. So the Muslim attack on, the fundamentalist attack on 9-11 dragged us into a war for which the Pentagon was, was fundamentally and culturally unprepared to fight. Well, combat isn't easy. It's easier, to know who you're, if you, it's easier if you know who your enemy is and at whom you're shooting. World War II is easy. We shot Japanese, we shot Germans, they shot us. We all wore uniforms, it was cut and dried. Vietnam, however, was more confusing. While the end of the North Vietnamese Army wore uniforms, the Viet Cong did not. And that's when you started hearing complaints, it's unfair, they're not wearing uniforms. Didn't have uniforms, they weren't, part, they weren't a real army. And then the 1970s, if you remember, warfare got really confusing. The PLO started attacking civilians, hijacking planes. Uh, the IRA was doing the same. The Germans, the Bader Meinhof gang, the Red Army faction from Japan and others, targeted civilians on the, on the premise that if we kill enough civilians, they'll, you know, we can't fight the American government, we'll kill some civilians, we'll, we'll let them fight them for us. So really, since Korea, the only conventional war we've had has been Desert Storm in 1991 and the opening weeks of Iraq in 2003. Otherwise, everything we've been involved in, Grenada, Panama, is, is, uh, and other places, uh, the, P the Israelis with the PLO, the Israelis with Hamas, the, the Israelis with Hezbollah, it's all really been uh, groups of in individuals uh, and non-state actors. And that's been a problem for the American military in the past few years. It's no fun fighting against a non-state actor. We have a brilliant Navy. They don't have anything. We can't use our Navy. We have a brilliant Air Force. They don't have any fighter jets. We have all this weaponry pent up, ready to go, nobody to fight against, which has been an issue. So what you hear is they don't fight fair. They don't wear uniforms or they don't stand and fight. All of which is true. But let me give you a definition of a, of a successful insurgent. A successful insurgent is one who lives to fight tomorrow. And then the Marine Corps expression is worth remembering. It says the enemy gets a vote. And the enemy gets a lot of votes 
when you're fighting in his country, in his village, in his language, on his terrain. And while people complain about how these insurgents or terrorists don't adhere to the Geneva Convention, let me remind you that the first successful insurgency came out of the United States. For those of you who remember Mel Gibson's movie, The Patriot, came out in 2000, his character was based on one of the heroes of the American Revolution. I'm looking at the audience here, and thank God there's a lot of people of my generation. We all watched The Swamp Fox, Sir Francis Marion. And what, what does Sir Francis Marion do in South Carolina? Didn't wear a uniform, took refuge among the locals, ambushed the bridges at every opportunity. Sounds like being a Kandahar today. And do you know why he fought that way? Because he knew that his colonial regulars, people like you, me, you, you, and you, couldn't stand up to the British. We couldn't stand up to the well-trained Brits. So, in the, so same thing with the Afghans. They know they can't outgun us. They're afraid of our technology. They think that we can actually see through a rock. Scared to death when our planes come over. So they came out at night. But, so, but the problem is that we tend to denigrate them. They're dirty, they smell, they wear turbans, you know, they think that, you know, toilet paper's kind of a plus over there. So we tend to denigrate them. They're not a stupid people. They're not educated, but they're far from stupid. And they're incredibly brave. In the past two years, they've handed our army two substantial defeats at Fob, at Fob Keating in a one not. Last year, when I was down with the Marines in southern Homond, they're attacking us through the cornfields. Hand, the Marines are pulling bayonets, fighting hand to hand. The Taliban loses, but they don't lose because of a lack of courage. They, do, they, are, they are motivated, and they do fight. So perhaps a better plan would be a combination, would be counterinsurgency, where you have some fighting and some, and some discussion. Because if you look at, since you, we have some, remember, combat's easy. We've got some incredible weaponry. We have firepower that can kill you from 50 miles away. Or like my son says, my son, the Marine Artillery, says, I can, find you, I can kill you at 30 kilometers, I can kill you, I can kill you as you stand. But once the U is over, and all the folks back home lose interest, then the hard work, hard work begins. Because once the locals realize we're going to leave, we need, we need to get them spun up, interested in their own future, and in fact, taking care of their own country so we can, in fact, leave and go home. And, there, so, and this is a, uh, you know, as easy to find, that we all know what that is. This is a shura, which is, which is a push to word for meeting. This is in Garm Seer in southern Afghanistan. I was there two years ago. Actually, I took the picture. Uh, Marines had gone down there to open up a stretch of road. Taliban attacked. Marines fought back. Taliban kept, uh, kept attacking. Marine, Marines kept fighting back. After three weeks, the Marines had killed close to 700 Taliban. Uh, in fact, they shot so many of them that the Taliban were running out of weapons. Within two days of the fighting ending, the locals came up when I was there and said, we want, to have, we want to talk. You've done a great job here. Here's what you need from us. Here's what we need from you. Could not have been better. So within 48 hours after the fighting stopped, we and the locals had come to an arrangement in that whole part, in that whole part of southern Afghanistan. Because they knew that once the Taliban was gone, what did we bring? Schools, doctors, jobs. I sat in meeting after meeting where we said, what do you want? They all come up with the same thing. We want women doctors for our wives and for our daughters. We want schools, and we like some jobs. And they said, we can grow food. Afghanistan used to grow food for, for that whole part of Central Asia. They said, you keep the Taliban off us, and we'll help you. We don't want your stuff. We'll do the rest, except for women doctors. So the strategy for this is called counterinsurgency or COIN. New to the Army, old hat to the Marines. Haiti, 1915. Marine Corps ran the ports, ran the government, ran the, uh, developed the mail system, helped build the first uh, airport down there. In 1940, they decided to uh, memorialize their years of experience down there, wrote what was called the Small Wars Manual, which they still use today. In 1999, they called it the Three Block War. Uh, on, the premise being on one block you're fighting, the second block you're, you're kind of doing some reconstruction, and you're bring, getting people set up, uh, bringing in doctors, the third block you're bringing in jobs. Transition to clear hole build, and then now called clear hole build transition. Transition meaning giving it back to the local, getting the government spun up at the same time. Because what, what counterinsurgency is, is a recognition that true peacekeeping and, and reconstruction starts once the fighting stops. Now it's not an exaggeration to say that the fight in Afghanistan will determine how problems in the third world and the failed states will be handled in the future. There's more riding on coalition success in Afghanistan than just mere retaliation for 9-11. If the international community fails, it's, 
is going to embolden every warlord, every drug dealer, every religious zealot, to kid, every pirate, uh, to, to think, believe that he can kill or kidnap Westerners without fear of retaliation. And even worse, in today's relatively secular world, is going to promote the rise of primacies of little, little nationalities, little marginal ethnic, ethnic groups, Chechens, Moldovans, groups of 5,000 people who want their own country, their own state, uh, and religious zealots, all of which serves to, to unravel modern society. So here's Afghanistan. This area is all mountainous, the Hindu Kush. Mountains 10, 15, 12, uh, 14,000 feet, just amazingly uh, hot in the day and cold at night, and fertile. This is all desert down here. Pakistan, Pakistan, Pakistan to here, and this is Iran. Interestingly enough, there really isn't any problem with the Iranians, because what the Iranians don't want is instability. See, of all the poppy and all the drug problems you have in Afghanistan, the, Afghan, the Iranians are trying real hard to keep it out. Their border is actually pretty tight. And what you've got in Afghanistan are these river valleys. You've got the Helmand River here, forget this one. So for, for a mile or two on each side of the rivers, you've got these huge, you got these huge farms. And that's where everybody grows. In between, there's just nothing. Mountains here. And again, back in the old days, before the Civil War in 1974, they exported food. Nowadays, it's sort of corn, wheat, grapes, rice, cucumbers, tomatoes. It's an agricultural country, kind of like this country was back in the 1880s and 1920s, except they probably won't transition to, to anything industrial. But the, and one of the things you have to remember is that while they're poor, they're not stupid. One of the things they've had in the past 36 years is nothing but warfare. They had a civil war. The Taliban came and the people welcomed the Taliban because it brought order. Russians came in and kicked the Taliban out. They, they, they welcomed the Russians who then exceeded themselves and they, they, they wanted to turn the place into mini Russia. Taliban came back, they liked that, then we came. So for 36 years, they've had nothing but warfare. Now, I thought I was going to talk to a lot of college students tonight, so I was going to say, gosh, most of these people have been fighting since your parents were, you know, since your parents' days of college. But now, like, looking at this audience, I can say, hey, they've been at war since we've been in college, and your kids would, they've not had jobs or opportunities because they've been at war, or they've fled, or they've been killed. But as poor as the Afghans are, they're very proud of their heritage. I was interviewing some soldiers two years ago, and I talked to this one kid. I said, Mohammed, everybody's name was Mohammed, why did you join the Afghan army? I'll never forget his answer. He said, my mother and father fought the Russians. My great-great-grandfather fought the Brits. His grandfather fought the Brits. We hate the Pakistanis. We can kill them. I want my country back. What an attitude that is. But with that attitude, you have to direct it so that when we're in a firefight that night, and this kid threw down his AK-47, pulled his knife, and ran across the field to knife a Taliban. Unfortunately, I didn't have a night vision camera, but it was an interesting night. They, they have more courage than, than you can possibly imagine. So, so, like I said, the Afghan army is good, they've got spirit. What they need is some better direct, which the Marines are providing in southern, in southern Helmand. Here we go. Gives you a good shot of the countryside. This is in the east. Just some little kid, you know, whatever, 18, 20 years old. The difference between them and our kids coming out of Paris Island isn't great. You know, full, you know, tremendously courageous, perhaps not particularly smart, but will do what he's told and he'll do it with a smile. And I mentioned the hills and the mountains. This is, uh, we're on the afghan pak border. This is uh, Easter, 2008. And this is Pakistan behind us. And hiking up there, pretty good shape at the end of a couple weeks of that. But the reason we need counterinsurgency compared to conventional war, you can't send, you can't send tanks into that area. You can't send armored vehicles. You can't send paratroopers because they fall on the rocks and they're all injured. So the problem is we've had all these military operations and we win the fight every time. And the problem with that is when we reconquer the same piece of ground and the locals seem to favor the people who, you know, who cut off their hands and steal their food, it's time for a new strategy. So we've got one. It's called Make Them Choose Us. This is counterinsurgency in a nutshell. Clear, hold, build, and transition. Just some Afghans I took that picture of the shore a few slides ago. This is some guys. They saw me with the camera, so they wanted their pictures taken. Get, clear is easy. Got to get the bad guys out. Taliban, Al-Qaeda, got to get the bad guys out. Hold, got to keep them out. Because if you, if you kill them all and you let them come back, the locals think to, your, to themselves, these guys, they're, they're, they're smart, but they're not very brave, so we, we don't want to work with the Americans because we work with the Americans, they let the Taliban back. 
but then build. Once they keep the Taliban out, schools, jobs, you know, doctors, and transition, real simple. Get a local government spun up so they can turn, their, it's Afghanistan. They speak Pushtu, they speak Dari, they're, they're, they're Sunnis. They, they, they know us, they know who we are, they like us, but they want their own country back. Help them, you know, help them take it back. Couldn't be simple, couldn't be easier. There's two types of Taliban out there, going back to clear hold and build. Uh, we, we refer to as big T and little t. The big T are the bad guys. They're the ones who are ideologically, religiously, or maybe because they're, they're gangsters or whatever reason, they're opposed to the West and we cannot reconcile with them. They've got to go. And the Marines and the Army are happy to, happy to help them do that. But the small T are the ones that we want to talk to. The small T guys are the ones who really don't want to fight us, but they don't want, to, they don't want their families to starve. The Taliban pays $300 cash to plant an IED. For, if you work with them for a month, they'll pay you $300. The going salary in Afghanistan for a non-Taliban is $2 a day. You got a wife, you got kids, you're not living very nicely, they'll pay you $300 to drop some IEDs in, or you make $60 scrabbling for a living. We're all family people, that's an easy choice. So what we want to do is bring in the doctors, bring in the jobs, and bring in the education to make the, the guy who really doesn't want to kill people, who just wants to farm, give him an opportunity to turn around and work with us instead of working with the other side. So counterinsurgency is kind of simple. It's really, it's a simple strategy. You shoot the people who deserve it, and you get jobs for the rest. But now we're going to look at the past year in Helmand River Valley. We're going to see how, coin, how counterinsurgency works. This is Helmand Province. And you got the Helmand River coming out of the mountains and going all the way south. Again, all the farms are right along here. Desert, desert. When I was in, and talk about hot, Musakala is up here. I was up there this summer in June, day after Father's Day, it's 152 degrees. When you go home tonight, put the oven on and put your hand in there, not your head, and think, God, the Marines lived like that? Yes, we did. It was so hot, I was actually up at my son's base, and we're walking, and I said, hey, let's just, you know, yes, we're walking circles, why don't we just stand here? He said, it's too hot, I said, now we can do this. At 152 degrees, and this is sand and baked dirt, the heat radiates up, so as you stand there in your boondockers, the heat burning to the bottom through the soles of your, of your combat boots, so you walk and talk. And then you got 60 and 70 mile an hour winds, so you got these tremendous windstorms and baking heat. And that's where your sons and daughters are working, and that's how they spent their summer. Taliban's used to that. They'll fight in that, and the Marines do too. Uh, we had air conditioning, except of course we ran out of fuel and then the air conditioning didn't work. Then you're, then you're in a hot tent. Open up the hot tent, then you let the wind and the sand in. It was an interesting, it was an interesting week. Okay. But what's happening now, we're gonna talk about an operation that happened a year and a half ago. There's fighting here in Sangin and Kajiki Dam. We've lost a lot of Marines up there in the past month. Uh, 24 dead, about 150 wounded. And the wounded are all double and quadruple amputees. It's all IEDs. Some firefights, but mostly it's an IED war. But the rest of the Helmand province has been cleared. Marja, that you read about, Marja is secure. I was in Marja in, in June before I, went up, before I went up here. We're building schools. And not only building schools, because anybody can build a school and have it empty, putting teachers in there. So kids are coming in. The markets are reopened again. So Marja, which people said, what a, you know, what a disaster that was. It took the Marines 60 days instead of 30 days, but they cleared it out. And then once they cleared it out, then you start filling it in with, with the NGOs and then the doctors and, and people and, and the, locals, the locals like that. Uh, I was to the east for two weeks, and the Taliban, again, they do fight. We were attacked, we were attacked every single day uh, in pre-planned, well-thought-out ambushes, firefights all the time. But when the locals see that, and the Afghan army came out with us, when the locals see that, it gives them the courage to work with us because they realize that we're going to stay. And once they see that, again, they have, they have a lot of courage. They just want to make sure they're not, left, they're, they're not sacrificed. But in late 2009, we started Operation Kanjar. Sent 4,000 Marines inserted by helicopter during the night. It was, this was the largest, it, uh, largest uh, helicopter assault since Vietnam, and also the largest operation, American operation in Afghanistan since we invaded in 2001. Because that's how few troops we had. Nothing happened at all. But by 6 o'clock in the morning, we had Marines walking through, through, through villages in the Helmand River, River Valley, where prior to that night, Nobody had been, no allied troops had been south of here. 
since, since 2001. So the Taliban and the locals were totally surprised. They were so outraged, in fact, that that day at noon, they attacked a company of Marines in the city of Nawa, which is right up around, oh, there, right there. Well, they attacked a company of Marines who spent a lot of time in Iraq, so that instead of the, the locals running away, the, the Marines returned fire, uh, charged the tree line, and killed the Taliban as they ran away. Uh, and the locals said, wow, we like that, because otherwise the Taliban was there, take 15% of the crops. If you don't pay, they chop off your hand. They may turn around and take, and take your wife for a couple hours because they're Taliban, they can do that. So the, so the locals don't like that, but they, again, they want to make sure that they're going to see if they, if they work with the, with, the, with the Americans, that the Americans will help defend them. So within 10 days, you had a situation where, like the one Marine said to me, uh, he said, we pursued them, we hunted them down, and we shot them. There we go. And the result was tremendous. It, but before we get to that, once you, keep, once you clear an area, you gotta keep it cleared. So for 10 days, you had these firefights through that whole area. Uh, and what the Marines did next, they set up their base, not back miles away, sit next to town, across the road, 25 yards away. So something happened that the, the locals knew, we got these kick-ass guys there who know how to shoot and know how to shoot a lot, right on the other side of the highway, they'll come help us. So you suddenly had a confidence factor there for change. Because physical presence is very important to the, to, to the Afghans. Again, they're not educated, but, the, but they're not stupid. And they, but they want to trust you, it's a warrior society. You eat with them, sleep with them, bleed with them, and they'll respond to you the same way. Then they respect you and listen to you. So during the day, we send patrols into town two or three times a day. It's called a presence patrol, where you meet, with, you meet the locals and talk to them. My name is Bill. I got kids. How about you? Oh, my kid is three. I go out with them, and, they, and I bring pictures of my grandson, and they always thought that was kind of neat. And whatever age their kid was, we'd always, oh, yeah, my son is five also. Yeah, I got a daughter, your daughter's age. You're building a rapport with them. And you buy some. Instead of going back to your base and eating MREs, you buy tomatoes from her. You buy potato chips that come from Dubai from you. You buy Iranian orange soda from you. What you're trying to do, you're helping jumpstart the local economy. And also what you're doing, we're no longer foreign invaders. We're customers. How cool was it? Gee, the Marines come through. They shoot the Taliban. And they buy stuff from us. Oh, easy, easy. I don't need $20 billion, I need $5 in ones to walk through a village. That's all it takes. Did a lot of that. And if you've ever spent any time having MREs, fresh, you know, fresh vegetables couldn't be better. Uh, four cucumbers for a dollar, bag of tomatoes for a buck and a half, and you pay them in the local currency, because if you pay them in the local currency, you don't ruin their economy. You know, we had a Marine out there who said, I want to buy a bag of ice. You got a block of ice, said, I'll pay $10. Can't, the price is a dollar. The fact he is $10, you've got to pay them in Afghan currency because they can't compete with us. So you pay them in local currency, it puts the money changer in business at the same time. Suddenly the money changer is a person of influence. You see these guys, they've got a card table. It's like, it's like seeing some biblical. He's got dollars, he's got Romanian, uh, Iranian reals, he's got Pakistani rupees, he's got Afghan Afghanis. He makes change in different currencies. It keeps him involved, it helps his business also. So what we do, we'd walk into town once or twice a day, we'd go over to the money changer, change 10 bucks, and then we buy stuff from different, different places and different shops in the, uh, in the area. Here we go, an Afghan village, the tire guy. He spent some time packing, spoke pretty good English. If you wanted a bicycle fixed, he'd do that. So we'd hire him for basic mechanical work, not that we couldn't do it, but the $3 we paid him meant a lot to him. The kids are kids, you know, they're knuckleheads all over the world, and, uh, they're yeah, Afghan knuckleheads or American knuckleheads that hasn't changed any. And they'd always try and say, hey, mister, buy something. They're hustlers. They try and tell us to take us to the father's store, that his store is better and cheaper than the store next door. Just, but again, that's, that's kind of business done in that part of the world. Then you sit down and have tea with them. And you become, again, we're, we're no longer foreign invaders. We're customers. They like that kind of stuff. They can do that. And then you do it again, and you do it again. And as you're doing that, you're getting intelligence, because you talk to the mayor. You talk to the school teacher, say, hey, how many kids do you go to school? Oh, there's, we can't have schools because there's no books. We'll get books. What do you want to do here? Our kids play soccer, there's no soccer balls. Next time we had somebody come down from Kabul, we brought soccer balls to the kids. It doesn't take much. The, the plane's coming down anyway. A bunch of $3 soccer balls. You can equip Afghanistan from a dollar store. That's how poor it is there. When I was in Iraq, the kids want candy. They, 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 you were there. You're throwing a wads of candy. It's like, it's like every day for them is Easter. 
We didn't bring democracy, but a whole, whole generation of kids that sugar diabetes. These kids want schools. They, would, they, they, said, they said, Mr., I want your pen. I want your pad. They want paper and pencil. They, they want to learn how to read. They prize education. Again, go back to parents, our age. Parents aren't educated, but they know education is important. They want their kids to be, they want a better life for the kids, like us. They want a better life for their kids than, we, than, we ha than they had, and that's what they're trying to do. That's what all this is about. And if you can address those points, then you can make them your friends. Now, we also got them in a jobs program. And this is where I diverge with the Army and the State Department. They came up with these huge projects, $100 million for this, $50 million for that. We hired a bunch of guys to clean the canals because they have a canal. The USAID built a huge canal system back in the 1950s and 1960s that, with 30 years of war, is all clogged up. We cleaned the canals, paid them five bucks a piece per day. They loved it. This is the first cash job they had some of these guys in 20 years. And you got an immediate result. You clean the canals. What happens next? The farmers have water in the fields. Oh, brilliant. Farmers have water in the fields. They got crops. They, where do they take the crops? Back to the market to sell that to the guys cleaning the canals for $5 a day. You've rebuilt the economy. Any economic students here? Nah. But anyway, you've now, it's a boring class. But effectively, what you've done is called the velocity of money. If I pay him, he pays the landlord, and he goes out, you've got money back in circulation, and we pay them in Afghanis. You don't need to, and, and once you turn around and do that, when the Taliban comes back, they couldn't come to us fast enough to say, oh, they're going to attack the dike at, number tw at building 22 tomorrow night at 3 a.m. Because, you see, did they like the Taliban or not? The Taliban jeopardized their jobs. If you jeopardize their job, you jeopardize their family. That's why something like counterinsurgency is easy. It makes it personal. Walking through the village, hey, Andrew, how you doing? How's your kid? Again, bring out pictures of grandkids, bring out whatever. They love that because they're family-oriented. They do the same for you. And again, you jeopardize their job, the only job they've had in a decade. Of course, they're going to respond to us like that. And, that's, and so I mentioned the Army and the State Department. They'll come up with a, jobs pro they'll come up with a road program for $25 million. They gave it. I was out there when this happened. They gave the contract to an Indian construction company, not an Afghan one. The Indians then brought in. They didn't hire Afghans. They brought in people from Nepal to work on the, on the road program. So the poor Afghan, the road's going through like 50 yards from his house. He doesn't get any jobs out of it. He gets not a dollars worth of benefit. So when the Taliban comes in and blows it up, the Afghan says, why not? I get nothing out of this. You want to blow it up? Don't blow up the canal. I'll kill you. Blow up the road. Be my guest. So when the Marines had, let me go back a couple of slides. There we go. Uh, Last summer, I was in this area. We're building a road, trying to rebuild the road. And we'd heard about the problems in the east with the Army, that disastrous road project. So the Marine colonel said, we have a new rule here. If the business goes to an Afghan construction company, if we have to help them, we'll help them, because we need to get these guys some money. And he said, anybody who gets hired has to live within two miles. If he's over anything more than two miles, I don't want him. We want the locals to have the jobs. So that road got attacked also. Who fought back? The Afghans. Again, it jeopardized their job. So they lost a lot of Afghans that way, but the road got built and they got more, and they got more reception. They, got, they, got more, they built a better relationship with the Afghans. We said, yeah, the Taliban's bed will help you out, and thank God we're still getting paid Thursday afternoon. Cash every Thursday. And Friday, back in Nawa, yeah, Mark, two to three shops to 60, 2,000 people. Schools, 1,200 people. I was, when I was there, there were 100 kids coming in per day to register. They loved it. The, the, the Afghans said, you got schools, you got teachers? Yeah, we got books. They brought them in by the, by the donkey cart. They electrified their own town. They built a water wheel. It's called Micro Hydro. They borrowed, they took our scrap wood. They got some scrap steel. They built a water wheel. Ugly like you wouldn't believe. It's like something out of a Marx Brothers movie. It went sideways. But it worked. Then they, they somehow bought or stole, we didn't ask, a quarter mile of electrical cable. They electrified their own town. Then they came to us and said, can we borrow your forklift? No, no. What do you need it for? We're going to put the water wheel in the river. So we got the big ass forklift, drove it on down, put the forklift in the river, and it worked. So for basically 10 gallons of gas, 10, ga 10 gallons of diesel fuel, we helped electrify the village. They did it themselves because they did it themselves because they knew that we were there. We knew that, they'd, that, that they, we'd help them with the Taliban. They had jobs. <clears throat> they had farms. <clears throat> you see how it all comes together. 
And it comes together by walking through cities or walking through little villages, shaking hands and saying, hey, that bad guy, we'll get him tonight. You good guys, help us, you know, tell us who the bad guy is. Because in the end of the day, Dari and Pashto, with the languages there, they're really difficult. You've ever listened to Hebrew, ever listened to Arabic, Pashto and Dari is even worse. So the chance of our guys, my son, you and others, out there trying to figure out, they're all bearded guys. We gotta shoot the bearded bad guys, not the bearded good guys, and, but the Afghans, they're the ones who are gonna tell us the difference. And they tell us the difference because it goes back to jobs and security. Simple as that. Nawa, with the, when I was out there, I met Senator Kerry. He said, wow, we don't know about this stuff in Washington. So I, of course, shoot my journalistic mouth off and said, what the hell, Senator, it's your freaking job. You're head of the Senate Intelligence Committee. What's the matter with you? So I'm not invited back. But he did say that the State Department doesn't let things like that get back because they're trying, they all have their own agenda. Speaking of agendas, when I was in Haiti uh, last January, you saw the Red Cross had, was asking for donations for, for Haiti. So when I came back, I spoke at the, Haiti, at the Red Cross in Philadelphia, <clears throat> who was bragging that they'd, that they'd raised or helped raise some $83 million in Haitian refugee relief from the American public. None of it had been sent down. As a matter of fact, most of it today has been sent down because they don't want to give, a, give the money to the Haitians, they give it to other NGOs. It's like brokers talking to brokers. It's like the Bernie Madoff deal, except the money finally gets down to the Haitians, but most of it hasn't gone down there yet. So same type of thing with the State Department. You see, going back to Red Cross, do they want to help Haitians? In theory, yes, but in practicality, it's an annuity. It gives them reason to stay in business, begging for money for 10 more years. Same thing with the State Department. Some same thing with the NGOs. And uh, it's a shame because if you just go out there and meet the people, it's a whole lot of you. Decent guy, spoke good English, decent kid. Old man made great tea, we were welcome any time. Just, uh, they sold us the sheep, we butchered the sheep. It was better than an MRE, could not be better. So anyway, coin, and I do get back to this, it's kind of a multifaceted approach where everything is important. Clear is important, the whole is important, bill is important, and giving it back to the locals is more important because once you give back to the locals, it's their country, they've got to do it their way, okay? So building up the local government is the best answer for a failed state. In a failed state, you've got no government, like, like Haiti, a bad government, like in Pakistan or Somalia, but the people's needs remain the same. Except for the religious zealots and the gangsters, they want what we want. I keep going back, it could be simpler. Jobs, medical care, we're not gonna discuss Obamacare, but jobs, medical care, and just living better than they did before that. And this can be done, and it's done if you look at the casualties the Marines suffer in place, uh, ignoring Sanguine, which is still combat, they'll lose one guy a month at best. One of the Marine casualties was because he drove his Humvee off the road at night. Isn't good, but it's not a combat fatality compared to some of what you hear going on in the East in the Army where you have these long drawn out firefights. Because if, if you don't give the locals a reason to like you, then, then, then you turn yourself back into a foreign invader. So if you have, and God forbid, a workable national government comes up, the, the problem in Afghanistan right now is Mr. Karzai. We can go back, we can do, if we, if we when we clean out Sangin, which hopefully won't be until after April when I go back, when we have all at home uncleaned out, and opium production has dropped way down, opium shipments have dropped way down, if we clean all this out, there's still a problem in Kabul. Uh, in August, last August, there's a scandal at Kabul Bank, where they said $100 million disappeared. Well, the truth is close to $300 million, and that's the shame because that's the bank that's used to pay the Afghan army. So the hope initially was that Karzai would say, oh, I guess I better clean it up. No, Karzai said over the weekend, you know, you wanna pay the Afghan army, I guess you people better do it. It's my $300 and we're keeping this. So the problem we're gonna have in Afghanistan now is that once this area is cleared, we can do so much. We get the local government spun up. We get, we get this done, we get that done. It's like a relay race. We're ready to hand off the baton for the last lap. Nobody to hand it off to. But that's not what we're here to talk about. I just threw, I threw that in passing. But at least with all the threats we had earlier, remember the, the early thing about the threat board? There we go. Crime, water stress, unemployment. Yes, you know there's, there's a little bit less of that in Helmand province today because of what the Marines did, because walking around door to door, they've cleaned that area out. And if they could do that through the rest of Afghanistan, it would change things a lot. Anyway, so that makes, at least in part of, in part of Afghanistan, it makes the world a little bit less threatening place. 
So guys, that's it. I thank you for coming out. My thanks to Nick DePippa for inviting me out. And I appreciate you listening and perhaps you have a couple questions for me. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, we do have time for some questions. If you raise your hands, we'll get a microphone to you. Johnny, one second. Question I have after hearing your presentation, in the United States, there's trying to be more dependence upon domestic sources of fuel. Do you feel, how much do you feel our foreign policy has an interest in buying fuel from the Arabic countries? Well, actually, in the past couple years, we've, like I said earlier, China imports more oil than we do. India will be soon uh, surpassing us to, be, to push us to number three. We'll buy oil from any place. But geographically, uh, which map was that? Here we go. Geographically and cost-wise, it makes more sense to ship oil out of here than all the way around here. We'll buy oil from anybody. We need oil. We need energy. We'll buy it from the devil if necessary. But I mean, we're going to get more oil out of here. I think now we get more oil from Canada and Mexico. Saudi oil is now number five or number six. That's dropping down. But the reason it's dropping down, if you're the Indians and you're the Saudis, it's like no freight. So, so economically, it's not a question of we want to do this. We don't control the energy market anymore like we used to. China imports most of it. They're almost number two. And freight-wise, we're paying, I'm going to make up a number, $10 a gallon, or $10 a barrel, Indians are paying one and a half. They can pay more, they can pay more to the Saudis for oil than we can and still have a cheaper price than we do. That's economics, if that answers your question. It's just, you know, we'll buy it from anybody. It's just a question of where, where it comes from. Nick, who else has? Okay. Sir. Hi. Um, my question was in regard to the um, president's uh, withdrawal plan uh, for, I think it's this summer. Do you think that's uh, feasible? And what oh, not going to happen. He'll okay. bring out three guys. Uh, he's already said that, uh, he's already said that the, we're going to have people there through 2014. If you bring people out now, serious, bring serious quantities out now, we don't have the people we need there. Mr. Obama did a great job. He put in close to four times as many people as Mr. Bush did. As ignoring the Bush-Obama uh, politics, Again, this is a, a labor-intensive war. Walking through villages takes a lot of Marines, takes a lot of soldiers. Can't do that if they're not there. High tech doesn't work. Let me give you another example. Last summer, we are out in Helmand Province and I was in this one camp where we had the drones flying over. And the drone, op the drone operator saw six guys with what looked like weapons. He said, let's shoot him, let's fire a hellfire weapon. The Marine colonel said, no, I don't think so. We've not had any problems from there. We'll send a patrol to investigate. It was six kids in their teens and, 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 and late, you know, 12, 14, 16 year range, gathering firewood. Had you turned around with the drone and let the drone guy fire a hellfire missile, we had six young kids killed, horribly, by the way, and imagine how, it's, how long it's been, how many generations they'll remember that. So that's why you want to put people on the ground and not bring them back here, but let them do the job they're trained for, which is walk around, like you said, shoot the people who need it and give jobs and help the rest. Real simple. One second, I'm right behind you. First, thank you very much for this presentation. And uh, uh, another gentleman and I have little experience uh, with what you're talking about and with the Marine Corps. Uh, but uh, your description of the counterinsurgency operations by the Marines is important, but could you give us a little context to that? For example, for the Marines to do what they're doing in Afghanistan requires aircraft carriers nearby, requires air bases, requires a wide variety of other support. What kind of ratio of support is there for each Marine that's in there doing what he's doing? I'm not sure. I believe it's about I believe it's about 50% uh, support to 100% Marines. So it's one to two. It's, it's, once they're on the ground, the, it's slightly different. The Army has a three to one support. The Marines come up with what's called a MAGTAF, a Marine Air Ground Task Force. We bring it with our own air. So once, the, once they're in, they stay in. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Be, yeah, because, was, yeah, let me go back to the map and I'll show you why. They've actually taken, a, they've actually taken Afghanistan and divided it out. You have, 
Helmand Province, Nimrod and Fra is now called RC Southwest, given to, given to the Marines specifically, run by Marine, you, know, you have Marine infantry, supported by Marine air, supported by Marine artillery. The only Navy are, some, are, are the Seabees. And then the Army is in RC East. They, Marines do it their way, Army does it their own way. They divide this up almost on purpose. If you brought another 50,000 Marines, there's just not enough bodies on the ground. I mean, it's, 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 again, I spend more time with the Marines. I mean, I've seen some of the Army, I've been out with the Army guys often, but not often enough to, to be able to talk about it and, and, and take questions. But the Air Force is doing things, they're supporting the Army. And again, the Marines come with their own air, and they're, so they're doing it their own way. Good, bad, and different. They, they took RC Southwest deliberately, made that a two-star command, and let them, let them do it their own way. You disagree. I guess I'm troubled accepting your view that the Marines can operate all by themselves outside the context of the enormous military and civilian support we're putting in that country so that the Marines can do what they're doing in the location of what they're doing. It's a great job. They, they, they all, but it's, but it's, it's so, it's so divided, and I think they, Petraeus and the group did it on purpose. Right before Stanley McChrystal got relieved last year, so when some reporter asked him how many people, how many, how many members of NATO are here, he said, "There's either 42 or 43. I don't know because the Marines don't call me back." And that's it's just uh, again, they don't use Air Force. They don't use. It's a whole different role. They, can, they bring their own logistics. Ma'am, you had something back there. A question. Thank you. One second. Oh, sorry. Bill, Peggy, right there. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Hand was the first. Okay. Well, to build on what Jim Guy just said, I'm wondering the extent to which you can have a victory in the area where the Marines are located and with that style of counterinsurgency, but have different results elsewhere so that you've got areas that are not stable, that are not cleared, that are not held, and then that sort of spills back over. And so I was going to ask, well, how do you see the difference between the Army's version of counterinsurgency as it's being implemented now and the Marine version? The, Mar the Army has a, has a problem because geographically, they've got to fight through the mountains. They've got this huge border that's indefensible. So the Pakistanis and the bad guys flood over on a nightly basis. The Marines have, with this being desert, it's easier to stop your, your incursions because a, it's less airy, and B, it's easier to find somebody on, on, on 60 miles of desert than coming through some pictures of some of those mountains. But it is a major problem, and like I said earlier, even if the Army gets everything done as successful as the Marines have been doing, again, Marines have a smaller area, it's like a relay race. Until the Karzai government stands up, we can only do so much. You know, we're, we've done three great laps. We're waiting for the anchor lap. That guy's not there. That's the problem. So even if the Army did, if they came up with the same success ratio, we still have an issue. That's, and that's nothing, that's something, that's something that neither the Marines nor the Army can, can address at this point, unfortunately. Anybody sir? else? Whatever. No, but this, I'm happy for a follow-up, sir. <laughs> sir, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I was curious as to whether or not you thought that the training of, of the Afghani military forces, uh, the police and security forces, f fell under the category of COIN and also what entity should control that, whether it be the U.S. government, NATO, or private security contractors? First of all, not the private security contractors. The more of them you get out, the better off we are. Right now, and going back to your question, uh, the Afghan army is trained by a joint army-marine uh, group up outside of Kabul, and then some of the groups go out to the east, some go to the south. The Marines take the ones in the south and, and train them, I was going to say retrain them, but no, but they, they train them differently and they train them longer. And so some, it's a whole different, it's a different institutional mindset. So basically what happens is you have, in the east you have the army and Afghan army fighting side by side, in the south the Marines and the Afghan army also fight side by side. So then it's just a question of really of, the, of how each group specifically gets, uh, uh, gets along. Their training is getting better. It's difficult to train people, however, who don't read and write. So you have, you know, courage is great, but when somebody says, hey son, read this, and the guy can't, that's an issue. 
He can't sign his name. Giving the Mac cards for payroll is horrified. They said, they're used to getting paid cash, give the guy an electronic card, trying to convince him that's, that's where his money was. He had no clue. You have some major cultural uh, issues that you have to, but, it's, but they, once you get over that, they do fight.